Well, bless my soul. Well, who'd have known? Well, who indeed? And who'd have guessed it come together on their own? It's so peculiar. Well, wait and see. see. A, A few, few days more. There may be something there that wasn't there before. Beauty and the Beast find love, but not at first sight. In one of the new movies we'll review this week and later in the program, Gene and I will join the debate over who should play Scarlett O'Hara and Rhett Butler in the sequel to Gone with the Wind. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune, and our first movie is Beauty and the Beast, and it's a flat-out winner, an instant classic with songs worthy of a Broadway musical and animation worthy of the Disney name. The story is, of course, timeless, even though it can be dated back to the 16th century. The story is about a selfish young man turned into a beast, and the only way he can redeem himself is to fall in love with a lady and have her fall in love with him. The young lady who will come to his rescue is a bookworm named Belle, one of the prettiest but most important, one of the smartest women in town. Now it's no wonder that her name means beauty. Her looks have got no parallel. But behind that fair facade, I'm afraid she's rather odd. Very different from the rest of us. She's nothing like oh, the rest of us. She's different from the rest of us. A threat to keep Belle from ever meeting the Beast is the man who wants to marry her in town, a selfish, muscle-bound stud named Gaston. The story is set in France, and Gaston looks and sounds like Robert Goulet on steroids. For there's no one as curly and brawny. As you see, I've got biceps to spare. Not a bit of him scraggly or scrawny. That's right. And every last inch of me's covered with hair. The Beast lives in a castle inhabited by objects that are alive, a singing clock, candlestick, and dishes galore as they prepare a banquet for Belle in the film's best-drawn sequence that ranks with the best in Disney history. Beef ragu, cheese souffle, pie and pudding on flambé. We'll prepare and serve with flair a culinary cabaret. You're alone and you're scared, but the banquet's all prepared. No one's gloomy or complaining while the flatware is entertaining. We tell jokes, I do tricks with my fellow candlesticks. Eventually, the beast is charmed out of his anger by Belle, who begins to see beneath his physical ugliness. True. Charming, but there's something in him that I simply didn't see. And in the film's most haunting song by the late Howard Ashman and by Alan Menken, Angela Lansbury, as the voice of the teapot, sings the title tune in praise of any couple that must learn to forgive each other's faults. Just a little change. Small to say the least. Both a little scared, neither one prepared, beauty and the beast. That is just lovely. Angela Lansbury has one of the most beautiful voices on the Broadway stage, and she has brought it to this film. The song is certainly going to be remembered at Oscar time. And what about the whole movie? Well, Beauty and the Beast could reasonably be nominated as the best picture of the year. 1991 has not been a great year for American movies. It could rank in the top five, along with John Singleton's Boys in the Hood. I love the music in the picture, the film's heart, and I love that little singing mm -hmm. candelabra Maurice Chevalier brought back to life in miniature. I've seen Beauty and the Beast twice with my children. I'm going to be back for more very soon. It's a winner. I was amazed how much I enjoyed this sure. movie. I had heard reports that it played at the New York Film Festival right. to a standing ovation, and I questioned I did too. those reports. I said, I can't see the New York Film Festival standing up and applauding anything. Yeah. Then I saw this movie, and I heard it interrupt, interrupted by applause again. It's amazing. You know, my favorite musical number is the Gas Stone number, where they talk yeah. about how great he is and how he decorates yeah. with antlers and so forth. It is a very funny film, and the energy level that's possible in animation 
action is so much higher than you can possibly get human actors oh, yeah. to move around that it almost makes animation seem like the ideal medium for the film musical. Uh, I, I think that's right. I think there's some other things that they do. They bring the characters across in arcing sweeps mm -hmm. that are as alive as anybody in any musical. The musical has been basically yeah. dead for the last 20 years mm -hmm. in, in American film. Mm -hmm. This one brings it back alive with a great score, and they've even got the details right. The majority of the animation in this film was done as it has always been done by individuals it's, working on these drawings, and you can feel their touch. It's a real pleasure. Okay, our next movie is named Black Robe, and this is a dark and thoughtful drama about the earliest days of Europeans in North America when Jesuit priests from France attempted to convert the Indians to Christianity. The film stars Lothar Bluteau. You may remember him as the lead in Jesus of Montreal. And he plays Father Laforgue, a zealous young priest who counts on his faith to sustain him in the bitter cold of winter in Quebec. You go to your own mission. Alone, Black Row. Ask your Jesus for help you, Black Row. The kingdom of heaven may be awaiting this priest's eventual converts, but on earth the signs of glory are hard to find. Who knows what the savages will do? Who knows what they think? I am no nearer to understanding them now than I was 20 years ago. They will probably torture and kill us both. Black Robe was directed by Bruce Beresford, who also made Driving Miss Daisy, and who was trying here to create a realistic portrait of early days in North America instead of the more sanitized and upbeat films that we usually get about missionaries and or Indians. The film is sincere and earnest. The locations are compelling. The acting is strong. But the message is one of unrelieved despair, not helped by a final title that rolls up on the screen to essentially tell us that all of the efforts of all of the characters in this film were completely futile. Well, but Roger, you know, uh, what I would say to you back, what is he supposed to do, rewrite history and say that the Indians flourished? I mean, we all know that they didn't flourish. Uh, well, the so Indians didn't flourish, and the missionaries didn't flourish, and furthermore, everyone we got to meet in this film was killed. Yeah, well, we all do die at the end. I mean, what do you, I don't know what you want. You want some kind of sweet epiphany? It is trying to be a different kind of film. And I think what, what where, I think where the film gets uh, al alive, uh, not, and is not evolved about death, is that it is tough on the missionaries. And it's saying that uh, this guy eventually does begin to respect that they do have an active religious life of their own that is worthy. And they do have a nobility, but a, a real strength of, in dealing with the land. And, and By they, you mean the Indians? Absolutely, I think so. And well, you think it's kind of tough on the Indians, too. You know, the Indians have been protesting this film because it shows them as very savage. Uh, I have a feeling that Indians have been <laughs> savage at times, and so I think the film is dead on accurate about everybody, and that the presumption of these, uh, and, and I'm, some of it was well-meaning, this guy is well-meaning, but the people that have institutionalized uh, uh, conversion uh, are not well-meaning, and I th think the picture is straight down the line, and I liked it physically. I thought it really took me back to what it must have looked mm -hmm. like, and I enjoyed that too. I grant you the locations. I mentioned that in my original review, sure. but it seems to me the movie is a complete depressing experience. Coming up later in the show, you we'll tell you who we know. each think should play Red and Scarlet in the forthcoming sequel to Gone with the Wind, and next, a review of Macaulay Culkin's new movie, My Girl. I'm going to marry Mr. Bixler. I can't marry a teacher, because then he'll give you all A's, and it won't be fair. I live with the Brady Bunch. I want to live with them, too. No, you can't. They have enough kids. You'll have to live with the Partridge family. Really? That, of course, is the Home Alone kid, Macaulay Culkin, as the boyfriend of a troubled little girl in My Girl. And even though Culkin is very good in the picture, it's not his story. The story is mainly about a very bright and terribly sensitive 11-year-old girl named Veda, who is the daughter of a widowed funeral director. Obviously, there's a lot of death in her life. A fine young actress, Anna Klumski, in her first film, plays Veda. Dan Aykroyd plays her dad, who is attracted to his new makeup artist, played by Jamie Lee Curtis but still mourning the loss of her mother. Little Veda doesn't want her dad to remarry. Mind if I tag along? Not at all. A lot of potatoes. Mm. It's for Shelley's famous potato salad. I'm looking forward to that. Hey, out! Damn it! Veda, watch what you're doing. Sorry. You know, this is gonna be my first 4th of July picnic for a long time. Really? <laughs> dad, didn't you say you needed prunes real bad? While still being preoccupied with death, Veda manages to experiment with life, nervously trying out her first kiss with her buddy known as Thomas J. Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, two and a half, three.
eventually Veda gets around to talking about her mother, who died just days after Veda was born. My mom said she's in heaven. What do you think it's like? What? Heaven. I think everybody gets their own white horse, and all they do is ride and eat marshmallows all day. And everybody's best friends with everybody else. When you play sports, there's no teams, so nobody gets picked last. And late in the film, Veda confronts her father with the same photograph of her mother as My Girl. Turns out to be a remarkably mature American film about death, mixing comedy with some very powerful scenes about a child's fears. Give a lot of credit to writer Lloris Elowaini for writing what I suspect is her own story of growing up. And you know what? I suspected it when I watched the picture. I did a little research. It's not her story. Her father was some kind of executive. Uh, and so this is really a very fine first script that's been made into a movie. And credit Macaulay Culkin, too, for taking on a small part in an original film. Howard Zeef directs with some sensitivity as well. The seriousness of My Girl, I think, is going to surprise people because they're going to say Macaulay Culkin has got to be cute and warm. But I think the picture will entertain them, too. It entertained me, too. And one thing mm -hmm. I liked about it was the way they were able to show fairly ordinary people here. For example, Dan Aykroyd yeah. as the funeral director is a role I think that's going to be overlooked in this movie, but the fact that he was fairly stolid, kept a lot of yeah. his opinions to himself, didn't have a lot of one-liners in every scene, mm -hmm. was very important because dads are seen that way, I think, by little girls and little boys as kind of distant, and so he wasn't her best buddy, and he was a father, and his relationship with Jamie Lee Curtis was something that she didn't really understand. Yeah. And she has to learn a lot in this film about the nature of life and death, and she she does. That's what makes it such a, a good film. Actually, the Jamie Lee Curtis character is the most conventional ca movie character in the film, and I was glad that she sort of disappeared in importance. There's some things where she does make up with a girl that are staged scenes, but this girl's story, it sta the film has a, a lot of heart. It doesn't end with a quick ending. No, Remember, no, it no. goes on past yes, a couple does. of yeah, normal no, endings. No. I, I like the story the way it's written. And this little actress, I guess that's condescending to, well, she's not a big yeah. actress, that's yeah. for sure, is very Good. Very good. And she and Culkin, who does have some kind of a natural rapport with the screen, are really important, too. Coming up next, Glenn Close plays a seductive and scheming prima donna in Meeting Venus. Is it true someone called you too old to play Elizabeth? Do I look like an old woman? <laughs> Me. Covent Garden. Sorry? Uh, Covent Garden. We, didn't, we did it like this in Covent Garden. It worked great. An international opera production in Paris turns into a collection of swollen egos and missed production deadlines in Meeting Venus, a fascinating and sharp-edged new comedy about the world of opera. The movie stars Glenn Close as a troublemaking Swedish superstar who at first dislikes the Hungarian maestro but becomes his ally when the company is torn by labor and ethnic disputes. Here they try to lighten things up a little bit. Of the hate, each other. Cold Swedes, stupid Poles, greasy Greeks hate each other. That's dirty communists, dirty fascists never speak to one another. That's Niels Arstrup as the conductor. They begin an extramarital affair that's fun until he realizes it will cause conflicts with his wife back in Hungary. I have to go away for two whole days. I have a concert in Budapest. Zoltan, come with me, please. Meeting Venus is a smart and funny movie that provides an inside backstage view of the chaos that goes on before the curtain goes up in an international opera house. The film is filled with dozens of well-written supporting roles, including backstage lovers, hard-bitten professionals, and the tenor who cares about nothing except getting hard currency for his auto-painting business. Meeting Venice was directed by Isvan Sabo, the leading Hungarian filmmaker, whose credits include one other great film about the stage, Mephisto. He knows a lot about show business, and he reveals a lot here. Well, I think Mephisto is about more than uh, show business. Yes, I think it it's, it's an extraordinary yeah. film. And it's about an actor, a yeah. portrait of an actor. This, um, this picture, for me, uh, really sort of fell into two parts. There is the uh, extramarital affair story, which I think is pretty well done. In fact, when there are scenes when this man is rushing through the streets of Paris, 
to, for his liaisons. Um, I think that, it, that it's a very uh, adult and smart film. And then I think the other stuff, the backstage stuff, is sort of cartoonish. It's sort of the things that we expect and suspect that we know about opera. And I think all the stock kind of uh, opera characters are brought out. Maybe that's the way it is, but I don't think it was anything special. I don't the way know. One it. of the things that I found interesting about backstage was all the emphasis on labor problems. For example, well, we know the that. chorus that stops at 11 o'clock so they I can have that. their coffee break. The guy who has to push the button to raise the safety okay. curtain. You haven't seen that before in the movies. No, no, no. Never no, seen that no, let me tell you something. I, what I, when I say that it's standard, it's what I suspect is true. I know it's true. Well, but we had a labor strike here in Chicago with our own symphony orchestra. Oh, of course, I've never I know it's seen true. a movie like this before. But so I'm it saying isn't it isn't. It's, it's not fresh. It's not predictable. It's never been done before in the movies. You know, How fresh can it get? Uh, because I just know it's a stereotype. Oh, That's because what happens. you're prescient, I guess. Coming up yes. next, Scarlet, the sequel to the novel Gone with the Wind, is going to be made into a made-for-TV miniseries. And so we will helpfully suggest who should play Scarlet and Wreck. I don't know if we agree. What shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. A sequel to Gone with the Wind named Scarlet has been published to almost unanimously bad reviews, but it's on the top of all the bestseller lists, and now it's been sold for $8 million to television. Yes, the sequel to the most famous movie of all time is going to be a miniseries, and so therefore, since we're on television, yeah. we can provide a useful service to the people who are making yeah. this uh, project. Who should play Scarlet and Rhett? And let's not beat around the bush, because it's a made-for-TV movie. Tom Selleck, a highly on. popular TV performer, is a probable choice. And on a recent Phil Donahue show, I saw it last night, it was, I think, a year old, he said he wouldn't take the part because, in his words, Clark Gable is irreplaceable. Well, he's right, but they are going to replace him. So my pick is an actor who I think will work well with my Scarlet. And this is the category I'm really sure of. My Scarlet is Demi Moore, a classic beauty from the South. She can play a spitfire, someone dreamy, someone willing to fight, someone willing to surrender. And you could see all that in her movie Ghost. Sam's dead, okay? He's dead. Tell her I love her. He says he loves you. Sam would never say that. And who should play her, Rhett? Alec Baldwin from The Hunt for Red October. He's big enough, he'll tower over Demi Moore, just like Clark Gable towered over Vivian Lee. He's a ladies' man as well as a man's man. He has a slick side, a brush side, as well as a charming side. You could see that in his picture, The Marrying Man. He was the best thing in the movie. I am crazy, nuts, absolutely insane for her. I think I've come up with a very compatible couple. It's not just picking two individuals. Will they work together? I think they will. Demi Moore might actually do the role. I don't know if anybody wants to follow Clark Gable. You know, I think one thing people are going to notice about your casting is that Red and Scarlet have both inexplicably gotten to be a lot younger since yeah. the original film instead of older. And I, I don't really think that's fair. I tried in casting the movie to get people who were in the right age, age segments, and I hope I did. When I think of the central quality of Red Butler, it's a sort of challenging, self-confident sexuality wrapped up in a tall, dark, and handsome facade. And although Tom Selleck has been mentioned for the role, darn it all, Tom Selleck is just too nice to play Rep Butler. Also, his voice role, squeaks in the uh, higher octave range. The role requires an actor who can project more of a hard edge, more of a menacing sexuality. An actor like Timothy Dalton, in my opinion. Now, I know Dalton is British, but so was Vivian Lee, and that didn't seem to bother anybody. Here's Dalton as James Bond, a character who has a lot in common with Rep Butler. Would you get me a medium dry vodka martini? What is Shaken, that? not stirred. In casting Scarlett O'Hara, there are three qualities I'll have to keep in mind. Her flightiness, her headstrong egotism, and her undeniable sexiness and charm. And there is one actress I can think of who would be terrific at combining those qualities with a convincing southern accent and who is the right age, and that actress is Meryl Streep. I would love to work with you when you make your move. I think we would knock them right on their fannies. <laughs> you really like the wind, don't you? When I want something... I go get it. And so I think Dalton and Streep would blow Demi Moore and Alec Baldwin out of the water. I, Streep is our greatest actress. I'm sure she could do the role. She won't get anywhere near it. It, it could only be a downside for her career. But more important, Timothy Why Dalton... Why would it be a downside to play Scarlett O'Hara? Beca because she will say, I'm, I'm trading with a classic. I can only lose. Uh, but here, know. Timothy Dalton, I think, is basically sort of too... He's a fine actor. Too narrow, um, sort of has a whiny quality to him. He doesn't have that big, imposing, tree like quality yeah. in the best sense of Gable. Well, That's why it's going to be tougher to find someone to, of quality to play Gable. Okay, what do you think? Write us with your suggestions here at Siskel and Ebert.
care of WBBM Television, 630 North McClurg Court, Chicago, Illinois, 60611. Give us your reasons. We'll read the two best letters we get on a future show, and we'll be right back. The movies we reviewed on this show. Too enthusiastic, thumbs up, way up for Beauty and the Beast, one of the very finest animated films of all time. It's on a level with Broadway stage productions, and it's a legitimate candidate for Oscar consideration as best picture of the year. A split vote on Bruce Beresford's Black Robe, the Indians and the Missionaries drama. Roger thought it was full of gloom and doom. I thought it was a fascinating historical document. Two thumbs up for the surprisingly good comic drama, My Girl, the story of a child coming to grips with death. And a split vote on Meeting Venus, the opera picture. Roger enjoyed the backstage byplay. I thought all of that was cartoonish. So Beauty and the Beast is the real Beauty discovery. Beauty and the Beast for adults as well as for kids. Yeah. That's it for this week. Next week, Angelica Houston and Raul Julia bring TV's creepiest family to the big screen in the Addams Family. Is this made from real lemons? Yes. I'll buy a cup if you buy a box of my delicious Girl Scout cookies. Are they made from real Girl Scouts? And Bette Midler and James Conn dedicate their lives to entertaining the troops in For the Boys. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed. Preferred stock, the extra smooth cologne for an extra special man. A distinctive gift from the House of Stetson. It's America's favorite jelly bean, Jelly Belly, now appearing at theaters and video stores with good taste. Jelly Belly beans, try them, you'll love them. Riceroni, the San Francisco treat, now with 30 flavors, you can serve it every day for a month and never serve the same dish twice. Exclamation, the fragrance that makes a statement without saying a word. Punctuate the air with wit and style. Exclamation, a now kind of fragrance from Cody.